All right. Uh, my name is Kathy Bakery Clips. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I'm a landscape architect with and a project manager in the Boston Parks Department. I also want you to make sure that you know that this meeting is being recorded and will be available on the project website, uh, hopefully by the end of the week. Please share that link with friends and neighbors who unfortunately couldn't be here uh, this evening. This meeting will be a little bit different than our typical community meeting pre-COVID. It will be an online presentation and discussion with the Parks Department and Design Team from Kyle Zick Landscape Architecture. I appreciate you trying this new format of meeting with us. We certainly miss seeing everyone's faces. This Zoom style webinar uh, has two ways to interact. You and the community there can view our video and our presentation. Um, and so, but we can't see you. Uh, you'll see that you can raise your hand. I'm gonna go through that in a second. Uh, and that will alert one of the design team members and individuals that you can be called on. Um, you can also enter a question and answer uh, in the Q&A dialogue box, and that will alert us to that. If you're calling in on the phone, uh, you can hit star nine to raise your hand and then we will unmute you or uh, I think you'll be able to use star six at that point. We can go to the next slide. Um, so if you're joining by phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute and unmute yourself. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a raise hand icon. Uh, please use that if you'd like to speak or you can always use the Q and A. Uh, box. You can exit by clicking on the red leave button at the bottom right. We can skip that one. We unfortunately don't have any interpretation tonight. Um, today we're going to talk about why we're studying Ringer Park now and what the schedule for this work will be, where the funding is coming from, share our site analysis study, and ask you for some thoughts about the site and then wrap up. I'd like to have us done by around 7.30. We can go to the next one. Uh, I wanna introduce a few people. Christine Brandeo is here with us tonight. She's our community outreach coordinator. She's waving. Um, and Kyle Zick and Danielle, Danielle Desolets. Did I get that right? Yeah, yes, perfect. Yes. Um, both from Kyle Zick Landscape Architecture. Uh, Connor Newman, I think, is also with us. He is uh, from the Office of Neighborhood Services. He's a great resource for things going on in the neighborhood that are maybe beyond this park, um, but also does a great job of getting uh, park issues that are directed to him back to us. Uh, in the audience, I see we have a few elected officials. Councilor Braden is with us tonight and Representative Honan. Uh, I don't know if they would like to say any words before we get started. Um, you can raise your hand if you'd like to say anything. Sure. Uh, I'm going to have Councillor Braden go first. I think I'm doing that right. Yeah, got me. I'm trying Thank, to... Thank you. Um, I'm really delighted to be here and to hear what we have uh, uh, listen to the discussion around the the master plan for ringer park it's a it's a little hidden treasure and a gem that uh it, it's it's past due time to uh do some renovations and restoration over there it's, it's such an essential part of our neighborhood uh especially with um increased uh um temperatures and hot summers uh it will help uh mitigate the impacts of our urban heat island effect in Alston. So I'm really excited to hear the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Representative Honan. Oh, I'm going to unmute you. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be on this call. I grew up right on Gordon Street in that and played in that park as a kid. I'm very excited that the Parks Department is uh, taking this on and I used to work for the Parks Department, and we also have, I'm sure Bob Peshek, who used to work for the Parks Department, is on the call as well. Uh, just a couple of things. I know you're going to do some wonderful things to the park. I would mention a lot of, there's a lot of dead trees in the park, 
maybe we can do something there if that's possible. And the park has a, a pretty, uh, pretty uh, serious rodent problem in the back. I've had city officials out there, Leo Boucher and others. It was at a time when you weren't using dry ice, when you stopped using it, maybe you can, I'm, I'm saying to you, it's a very serious issue in the back of the park. And I know there are certain other issues pertaining to things like that, which don't actually uh, deal with the physical structure and other issues that you're probably going to be taking on. I just want to thank Councilor Breeden, thank the mayor for, and the parks department, because the park hasn't had attention in a while. And I know there are a number of people in the area, uh, Joan as well, Pasquale and others who've taken an interest in it and have brought college kids to do cleanups, the dog walkers down there and the other basketball tennis is in there too, tenacity. So it's a very well used park and I'm very excited that you're taking this project on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, are there any other elected officials in the audience that would like to say a few words before we really get started? Raise your hand if uh, if that's the case. Okay, uh, if we can go to the next slide. So when we consider park improvements, we're in include, incorporating a lot of different factors. We have the City of Boston priorities and the, specifically the Parks and Recreation Department's goals. We have safety and regulatory guidelines and community input. Uh, all of these come together to influence the park design. Next. Um, so specifically, the City of Boston improvements, uh, we're incorporating a lot of different uh, factors when we look at our open space. We have uh, expanding walkable access to parks. Boston was the first city on the East Coast to have a park within 10 minute walk of every resident. And that's a, a fact that we're very, we're very proud of. We want to address equity in our open space, create climate resilient parks that withstand our changing environment promote the health of our re all residents and create healthy parks and prioritize housing and community building in our city. Specifically in the parks, we wanna create parks that are accessible and available to all, build parks that are diverse, balanced, and have a mix of uses efficiently, have a meaningful and inclusive community engagement, we want to create adaptable and resilient landscapes and promote connections with our parks. Greener Park has remained a constant in Alston while a lot of changes have occurred around it. Boston Parks wants Ringer Park to keep up with the neighborhood. We want to develop a long-term plan for the park and prioritize short-term improvements to get us to this vision. Past improvement projects have studied individual park elements, but have lacked the connections between those program elements. This has resulted in some areas like the playground and athletic facilities being regularly updated and others lacking investments over a longer period of time. Tonight is the first meeting of the initial phase of design work for the comprehensive plan. We anticipate engaging with community over all three phases of our work. Here, while we develop the site analysis, later this fall, while we consider design alternatives, and over the winter when we finalize the comprehensive plan. This online meeting is not the only opportunity for input in this phase. Later on, we'll share some additional ways we're asking the community for their thoughts on the park. The funding for this design work is coming from the City of Boston Capital Plan and some recent development projects in the neighborhood. We don't have funding for construction, but are using this phase of work to identify the needs of the work, needs of the park that need to be done, prioritize those items and develop cost estimates to tell us how much those uh, improvements would cost. When we're ready to implement the projects, we will again be discussing the specifics plans for the work with the community. And I'm gonna turn the slides over at this point to Kyle and Danielle to talk about the details of the park. Thanks, Kathy. Um, just wanna say good evening to everybody and thank you for joining us. It looks like there's a, um, a good chunk of people um, with us tonight and that's fantastic because 
our goal for tonight is just to hear as much as we can and get as much input from you all. But we're going to start with talking a little bit about what we've learned um, about the park and what we know about the park um, since we were brought on by um, Boston Parks to look at the mass, the, the comprehensive plan. So I'm Danielle Desilas with Kyle's Atlantic Architecture. I'm a senior associate and the project manager for the design team. Um, so just to start um, back out a little bit. So Ringer Park, of course, is in Alston, um, on Alston Street, Gordon Street. It's got connections to uh, Emory Street and um, a couple of the others just south of uh, Mass Turnpike and not far from Com Ave. So just want to show some context there. The next slide, we looked at some of the other parks in the area. Um, Boston Parks and Recreation has 17 properties in the Alston Brighton area. Um, probably the, the biggest park in the area is, um, is Smith, which is just north of the, our site, um, closer to the Charles River on the other side of the Turnpike. Um, and it's, it's substantial. It's got pump track, it's got multi-use fields, it's got a lot of different components in it. Um, there's also, which not on this slide, uh, there's um, Roger Park to the west, closer to Newton, um, and Maloney Park next to the library, um, which has some of the more scenic um, components in public art that we have a little bit of at Ringer too. Um, looking at some of the, the parcels that are on this slide, there's um, Portsmouth Playground, McKinney. Uh, most of these, I think all of these properties have playgrounds to some extent, and many of them have splash pads. Um, Portsmouth, Penniman, McKinney, um, all, and Fidelis Way all have basketball courts. Um, some of the others have some fitness stations, multi-use fields. Um, McKinney has a baseball, softball, Little League, and batting cage as well. So just kind of give us some context so we understand what's in the area um, generally. Um, so we, we're thinking about what other um, activities are already provided in the area. So next slide. Um, so this is Birds of View, slightly different way of looking at the park. Um, up to the, um, the upper left is Alston Street. Um, and where we're showing right there, that's obviously the West End house. Um, and then uh, Gordon Street is off to the right of the slide. So it's a little different perspective. Jackson Man is on the lower left side. So you can see the tennis courts, basketball courts, baseball fields, um, playgrounds right kind of in the middle and the whole site kind of slopes gradually up to the top of the slide towards the West End house. And then the swath of trees is um, all that the urban wilds portion of the park. Um, and then the main spine that runs through it from connecting Gordon to Alston Street. So just a slightly different way to look at it, but I think it's always interesting to look at a new perspective um, and look at the park holistically. It's a little bit easier to understand times than, sometimes than a, an aerial plan. Um, we also wanna talk, next slide, a little bit about the historic development of the park. I think, especially at KZLA, we always find it very interesting to understand how a landscape progressed um, and why, um, how it became what it is today, to understand how much uh, of that moves forward um, in, the, in the future planning. But we like to look back a little bit too. So as you can see, this is a 1875 city map. The area highlighted in red is more or less the park limits today. It was one large track um, owned by John Hollis. It was a, a very large um, estate, which I think was a cattle, and uh, in, in the cattle industry anyway, Hollis was. Um, not long after, um, part of the property was owned by the Ringer family. In 1915, the family donated the land to the city in memoriam of their son, Stanley Ringer. Um, who was killed in World War I. And apparently he was actually the first volunteer um, for the military for armed services for, uh, from Alston. And the Ringer household was actually on, there was two houses in this parcel later um, and the Ringer household was one of them. Apparently there's also a, a quarry on the Southeast corner next to those two sites um, in the early 20th century. Um, Shortly thereafter, after the land was donated, um, like I said, circa 1915, um, you can go to the next slide, please. It became a park um, in 1916, though it wasn't it kind of slowly progressed. Um, baseball was extremely popular in the early 20th century, so there was a lot of ball play on the site. Um, and shortly thereafter, um, there was uh, a field house. Um, 
and some tennis courts, which were developed in the, in the 1920s. So in 1931, you can go to the next slide, shows the actual site itself, the park site. So um, Alston Street is on the bottom of the slide. And um, Gordon, you can just see the little bit of it at the very top of the slide, the top of the side. Um, so this is a 1923 plan that was prepared. Um, as I mentioned, there were tennis courts already. You can see the baseball is kind of ubiquitous in this area. So that has always been a, a baseball field in some orientation or another in that corner near the school. Right in the middle where the playground is today was actually a field house. Um, and then the portion on the left was actually a bay of swings with a little bit of a, an overhead a pergola or overhead structure. Um, there was a flagpole and that's pretty much it in the 1920s. But you can see, which is interesting, there's kind of the square outline for the West End house, which is identified um, early on. So 1920s, even though it didn't move till much, uh, several decades later. Um, so right from the very beginning, um, it was a playground, a park, sorry. Um, it's been developed a long way, redeveloped a long way in 1931, they redeveloped it. I'm sorry, this is actually the 1931 plan. Um, in the 70s, it was redeveloped to add the basketball, convert two of the tennis courts, because you see there was four here originally, two of those tennis courts became basketball courts that we have now. Um, the field house was removed and tot lots, a tot lot was added in. So in the same general area, but slightly different configuration than we have today. Um, the next slide shows um, a much later plan. So this is in 77, there was a major reorientation of the ball field to more or less what it is today. Um, so it had better sun angles and no glare if you're, um, so this is closer to the proper orientation for a ball field. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, field house became tot lots. Um, pathways were all upgraded in the late 80s. The entrance um, on Ermi Ave was added um, with the, the circular turnaround. So that came in the late 80s. Um, ball fields were updated again not so long ago. And then in 2005 was the last significant renovation, which was the update, the most recent update to the playground. Um, and that's the configuration that we have today. There's also um, the stairs that, that were there leading up to the playground, but they added a ramp um, for better accessibility. Um, and they also added the splash pad at that point. Um, yep, so that's right. Well, thanks, Danielle. Um, I'm Kyle Zick, landscape architect, and I'm going to kind of grab the baton and go a little bit more detail about the site. And we're describing our observations um, on what we've seen, one to share that, but also just to kind of get the conversation going, because we're going to hit on some topics that you're going to say, oh, yes, I want to talk about lighting, or I want to talk about benches or the playground, whatever it happens to be. We hope that some of these images and topics kind of spur you on to give us observations that will help us design the site. But as we mentioned early on, this site is really kind of interesting because of its variety. You know, here's a collage of photos that show, you know, the baseball field, the courts, so there's active parts of the site, but then there's also wooded areas and steep slopes that are much more passive and, um, and not active like the ball fields. And then there's a playground that caters from age two to five to five to 12. So there's a lot of opportunity here for multi-generations and for different uses, depending on what you're looking for. So, you know, it, another way of saying it is that this site, if we're looking at it from the air, um, Alston Street on the right-hand side, Gordon on the left, you know, the site has a lot of different personalities, um, depending if you want to be quiet and be by yourself, you know, you could walk through the urban wild or find a tree to um, sit under. If you want to be on display, you know, there's plenty of opportunities for that as well. Um, so the site offers a lot of different opportunities depending on how people want to use them and, and use the site. So just a few things more specifically, just to orient yourself, um, you're going to see these plans over and over as we talk about different topics. But um, West End House here, passive use, you know, so passive um, is on the hillside where, you know, people can, you know, walk up there, climb up there and hang out, but it's not something you're going to throw a Frisbee or throw a baseball, that kind of thing. Little League Baseball is here. Each one of the entrances is highlighted with these magenta arrows. The play space here, the courts here, and the urban wild is the wooded area with the trails. 
we label this as performance space, that circular um, sidewalk area. That's how Boston refers to, uh, Parks Department refers to it in terms of permitting. Um, but I, we'd also be curious if you all think of it that way. Um, you know, it's also, you know, it's just, it looks like it's the heart of the, the a part of the park, but I don't know if people really gather there or not. And we also looked at the records of the permits that Boston Park, Bar Boston Parks has. And just to give you a summary of that, the Little League field is permitted almost daily, especially in the fall. The playground and that performance circle, you know, it, it varies, um, but it is permitted in the summer and in October. The courts are, the basketball courts are, two courts are permitted March to October, two days a week, and the tennis courts are permitted March to August, five days a week. So there's quite a bit of use there. Then in terms of just some of the more physical aspects of the park, here are the different walkways. So same orientation as the last map, I start off with this purple line and that's concrete pavement. Now I'm not making a judgment about the condition of the pavement, but that's just what the material is. And this yellow line is gravel path, blue are asphalt and orange are packed earth trails. And then this blue dashed line we call that a packed earth desire line. So this is where people want to walk, but there's not a pathway. So we've just worn a path there because it makes sense to how the site is used. And a few photos just further um, describing these things. I mean, you all know what asphalt and concrete look like, but we highlight with these red asterisks, which of the materials are not compliant in terms of accessibility. The packed earth paths, gravel, um, while the concrete and asphalt, when they're new, are compliant um, in terms of a surface. So then we've done another analysis of the site in terms of accessibility and code compliance. The blue shows that's an accessible path. So you're gonna quickly say, oh, from Alston to Gordon, it's accessible, but why not right there? And if you know the site, that's where the walkway rises up very quickly over a hump and then back down. So those grades are too steep. Um, according to the ADA regulations. But the blue lines for accessible areas continue in that circle. There's accessible routes to the ball field, um, players benches, dugouts, and then also to Webley Street. Now all these red dashed lines are non-accessible paths, meaning that either because of slope or the material or width, grade changes um, are not compliant. That doesn't mean they can't be, but one thing we would hope as part of this process is you'll say to us, you know, we really want an accessible route through the urban wild from Alston to this main spine. That's just an example. You may not tell us that. Um, other things we have to look at is having accessible routes to the playground and to other features, you know, to the courts. And then other things that you may not think about are some of the site furnishings. Um, the benches on site have to, a certain percentage of them have to have uh, accessible companion pad next to the bench in case a wheelchair, uh, someone in a wheelchair wanted to sit next to uh, someone they were with who was also in, who was in the bench. And then there's other things like um, at the entrances, we have materials like cobblestones that are um, a not compliant surface or bollards, you know, restrict pathways, that kind of thing. So there are a number of things we're going to look at real hard from a code compliance standpoint and just to make you aware of those. The topography and elevations on the site have a lot to do with how the site's used, how it's been designed. Um, and these colors just represent from low elevations to high elevations, lowest elevations being this green and blue, the highest being this red pink color. And, you know, it's, I mean, you all know this, if you know the site, the West End house, it's high, you know, you can see the hill just kind of radiating down from there and that path that goes from Alston to Gordon is basically at the toe of the slope, the bottom of that slope, and then there's that flat area where the more active uses are. Another way to look at it is how steep those slopes are. The, the red color shows the steepest slopes, um, and yellow are the flat areas. Again, no um, coincidence that the, the ball fields are in the flat areas. What's interesting about the site is there's a lot of views that go beyond this site, and views that make you forget, you know, maybe that you're in kind of a densely populated part of the city. When you're at the top of the hill here, you can see for miles and feel like, you know, you've kind of escaped the city in general.
but there's other views like of the West End house or of the circular space or long views of the courts that are important. Some of them are just from a an aesthetic standpoint or you know, kind of space shaping. Some views you'll also say is, you know, we, and we've documented this differently is, but I can't see there, or I can't see someone who's in that spot. So that will be important for us to talk about. And here's just a few photos of some of those views starting in the lower right from the playground looking down at that circular space or from the main spine looking up at West End House at the top of the hill looking at the wooded area or that skyline view that I described or of the courts. So site furnishings, um, that includes benches, drinking fountains. There aren't a lot of furnishings on the site. Um, there are some around the courts, a few at the playground. Um, and you know, there's bleachers at the um, baseball field, but otherwise along the path or in the woods, there are no benches and that kind of thing. Um, so it's fairly limited. Photos of these features, just to refresh your memory, there's a couple drinking fountains and here are bench, uh, photos of the benches. The vegetation, you know, um, was mentioned early on in terms of the condition of some of the trees. Um, there, there are some dead trees. There's a lot of trees that need to be pruned. Um, the good thing is that over the different renovations and different generations here, trees have been planted. Um, you know, so there's Zelkova trees kind of circling in in this area. Um, there are some invasive trees, um, trees that aren't as desirable, you know, between the pathway and the courts or even in areas um, on the steep hillside. So that's something that we'll look at. But, um, you know, there was a mention of climate resiliency, the urban wild and these trees actually do a lot in terms of storing carbon and improving air quality and um, offsetting the heat island effect in this area. Zooming in more closely to the play area. Um, it's that area that Danielle mentioned early on was a field house and had a shade pavilion. There's a age two to five portion um, with appropriately aged equipment. And then the five to 12 area here, there's a splash pad in the center. There's some swings and there's a few game tables and there's a few trees sprinkled throughout here. There's a set of stairs that takes you down all the way and there's an accessible route or a sloped walkway that takes you down as well. And there's a set of stairs here. There's a steep embankment that has been clad in granite on the backside um, as it starts to head up the hill toward West End House. And just a few photos of some of that play equipment in the two to five equipment in the background, the splash pad here, um, that granite embankment that I mentioned in the game tables and then looking beyond to the swings and the five to 12 equipment and some of the trees. So the urban wild, while it's not designated an urban wild officially with the, um, the urban wild program with parks department, it certainly fits that um, you know, definition. You know, here we have, um, you know, I would say kind of natural in quotes woodland um, with uh, rock outcroppings, it's pretty dramatic and it's kind of an interesting escape from the hustle and bustle, you know, the green line and traffic and, you know, city conditions. Here's, you know, um, kind of a natural escape. Now, I imagine most of these walkways were just created as desire lines, as people wanted to get to the different ledge outcroppings and views, or just to go from Alston Street to Gordon. They've been improved in different ways, either with gravel, um, some wood chips, but um, you know, it's an interesting contrast to the rest of the site. This yellow line is the property line. So these paths don't know property lines. You know, people continue um, from parks department land across the West End house to the high point of the site. Um, and you know, also some of these paths are something we'll want to look at in terms of their maintainability or even their sustainability. Some of them go straight up the hill and have pretty serious erosion because of that, because they're so steep. And you know, while I, I mentioned a lot of the positive aspects of the woodlands, which you know, some of these photos represent, there are also, there's trash dumping, there's um, bottles and cans and there's graffiti. So while there are these sites that are an escape, they're also harder to um, see people and to maintain. 
And we've talked about the active parts of the site. You know, this just, again, highlights the Little League baseball field, the basketball courts and tennis courts. And the courts have been renovated fairly recently. Um, the baseball field, you know, that's something we'll talk about as part of um, this plan for sure in terms of renovation. And then the entrances, what's really great about this park is that the neighborhood has so many options for entrances to come into the park. Um, you know, there's five different entrances here that, um, that allow you to come to different portions. And then it also serves as a thoroughfare for some people who are just wanting to go from one side to the next, maybe not use the park other than just for, um, you know, to pass through. The entrances have different personalities, a number of them are marked by a mortared stone wall with entry piers, uh, the two on Alston Street and the one on Gordon. The other two entrances are basically at dead end streets, um, you know, the one at the Jackson Mann School or at um, Emory. And, you know, if they're celebrated or not celebrated, you know, depending uh, on your perspective, but there are things that can be done from a design perspective to make these more approachable, um, more attractive, um, that kind of thing. We also looked at lighting. I was very curious to see what the site felt like at night um, and what areas were lit well and which weren't. These, you know, it's the same map that I've been showing you with Alston Street and then Gordon. These yellow circles or ovals represent um, at least a, a diagram of the light shed from each one of these light fixtures, which is the brighter yellow circle. And I have photos as, as well to kind of represent the character of the lighting. But what I would say is that the lighting along this main pathway is pretty good. You know, it's bright and fairly consistent. Um, it continues to Webley Street, but you know, the ball field, the courts, um, the passive use, and then the woodland area are definitely dark. And some of the things you'll see in the photos are, you know, the contrast between the light and the dark. While you'll see good lighting here uh, along the walkway, there's a great contrast not far off the walkway. The, and you also have light coming from other uses. The Jackson Mann School, you get a lot of uh, ambient light from the building. And um, the playground is actually fully lit. So it, you know, it, it's a space that feels very comfortable when it's dark. But you look at some of the entrances, Alston Street um, near um, Glenville Ave, um, definitely dark because there are no light fixtures and there's only one street light at this one. So we covered a lot of ground in terms of topics. Hopefully that kind of uh, spurs you on or inspires you to talk about certain things that are important to you in the park. Um, and I would look forward to your feedback um, and we'll take your questions and answers and comments now. Thanks Kyle and Danielle. I'm going to quickly review how to ask questions um, and raise your hand for those who missed it. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a raise hand icon that will alert us that you'd like to speak and we'll call on you in the order that, uh, that you've raised your hand. Uh, you can also ask questions using the Q&A box. Um, I think a few people have made some comments during the, during the presentation and, and I've marked those that we're going to answer those live. Um, before we get started, though, I want to set out some guidelines for our conversation that can be helpful. It's hard to understand each other uh, when we can't see each other's faces. So we want to be respectful of each other and the community and use respectful language. These are our neighbors. Let's share airtime so everyone get, can get a chance to be heard. If you disagree with something that was said, consider asking a question rather than arguing to prove your point. That said, it's okay to disagree, but just don't personalize it. Focus on the idea and not the person. Please speak up if the process doesn't seem fair. If you talk about people who are not here, please don't use their names. Please speak for yourself, not the group. We all share responsibility for making this group discussion productive. So most of all, let's listen to each other. Okay, we have about, so oh, we have quite a bit of time. So we have almost an hour, about 50 minutes uh, left for Q&A. Um, so um, I don't think we have anybody on the phone. So I'm going to um, 
I'm going to let's have Christine Varial uh, ask her question, and then I'll go through some of the, the questions that have come up in the Q and A. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, so I got a few questions and, and comments about the park. So um, whenever I've gone to Ringer, the softball, baseball, little league field is is pretty much used as a dog park. And so I wonder if there is a way for the city to like add an actual dog park to the park since like having dogs in that area isn't always necessarily the safest option. Um, it's not fully enclosed. There's no running water, which I know is a um, requirement for dogs, dog parks in the city. So I think having some sort of dedicated space for the dogs would be helpful for both dog owners and people who just want to go to the park. Um, and then there's the performance space that's laid out in the park. Um, I have tried hosting events in the park before and it's very difficult to get permitting. So if there is a way to make that process easier for people, um, that would be awesome because it used to be more vibrant in the summer with live music and things like that. And over the past few years, it's it's been a lot more difficult. Um, and then I know there's the splash pad in the playground, but I'm trying to remember if there are like water bottle refill stations or water fountains, things like that. Um, those were added to Smith Park recently and they've been awesome. So big fan of that. And um, an overall comment, I like the balance um, between like the more active spaces in the park and the passive spaces, because I think it's really important to have that good balance. Because again, referencing Smith Park, it's like a super recreational park and there's not really a lot of space to just like hang out. So that's why I like Ringer Park. Yeah, the, the really great thing about Ringer, about all that topography is that you can't put active recreation on those hills. So it becomes, um, <laughs> it becomes, passive by default, which is great, frankly. You really need those spaces in the city. Um, just a couple of points. Um, the, the drinking fountains that are there are the old style. Um, um, and we've been installing the bottle filling stations uh, in parks that have active recreation. And so that would definitely be on the table for, for the site. Cool. Um, I am looking at, um, I'm also project managing uh, Smith, so I happen to know that quite well, um, which I think is why your name may be familiar to me. Yeah, I definitely was at one of those Smith meetings, like yeah, thanks earlier for, this year, last year, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we are still talking about a dog park at Smith, but I understand that this feels, you know, like on the other side of the city, because uh, you do have to cross the pike to get there, but, um, you know, we're, we're prioritizing putting dog parks uh, in different parts of the city. So if dog park goes in Smith, I don't know that Ringer would be um, as high a priority. And hopefully some of that would be, um, that use would be lessened because there is a dog park. There will be a dog park facility at Smith. Um, so that's something that we will identify as a current use and put a pin in, you know, the long-term uh, ability of this site to accept that um for the other points that i missed but um that's um, just the events permitting stuff but that's not really yeah i will on you it's a little bit opaque now um but and there have we have not been issuing as many permits um yeah, yeah of because of covid so uh, so that has definitely affected it, but um, we'll, we'll work on that. So I'm gonna address one question um, from the Q&A and then we'll, we'll go to the next person. Um, are you planning to do a survey time study to determine how the park is used? We use the park every day uh, and most of this does not accurately represent how the park is used on a daily basis. So yes, we do have a survey. We're gonna get to that uh, at the end of the presentation, but you can also go to the project website if you go to boston.gov and look at uh, search for Ringer or go to boston.gov slash ringer dash park. That will point you to the survey. Um, so Marta, I'm gonna um, allow you to unmute yourself. Hi, Ms. Marta, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so my name is Marta. I'm a neighbor to the park. I live on Armington Street, which is just off of Webley, right on the corner. I have a daughter who is six. We use the park daily, basically since she was born. Um, so yes, I can agree with the previous person uh, or the person who asked, like, is there going to be a survey because not everything is represented. The, um, there's a few things I would like to mention uh, from the perspective of being a mom having a kid and also um, in regards to the use of the baseball diamond as a dog park, which has been highly intensely used every single day, morning, afternoon, evening, all the dog owners of the neighborhood come and they need a spot. It's just as a mom with a young child, um, she has been run over by a dog before who was unleashed in the baseball diamond and just ran over her. And so um, it, it's, it, we avoid the space because first of all, I'm scared we're gonna step into something. Um, and second of all, I don't, I never know who's kind of come in with their dog and um, unleash the dog and let it run around. So um, that, you know, that's a bit of feedback that I think a, a dog park could be a big priority here and it would be very well used every single day. Um, secondly, the playground, we love our park. We go every day. Um, we like the play structures. Could they be upgraded? The swing set for sure. Um, the, the water fountain there hasn't been working for years, has been clogged up. It will spray water everywhere and you can't drink properly. The splash pad, um, the floor is very slippery. The concrete, like the paint on the concrete has worn off. So if you walk, if the kids are bare, barefoot, um, bare feet with the water, they will slip and fall. So that could be improved. Um, for the rest, it's trashed a lot. I know that's not maybe your responsibility, but there's always glass um, and cigarette buds everywhere. Um, what you call the wild ur urban wild area is um, the scary area for us. We would <laughs> we would just not go in there because it's it's not it doesn't feel safe. Uh, even though I would love to be able to just, you know, take my daughter and go for a hike there, um, be in the trees, but we don't feel uh, comfortable doing that by ourselves. The slopes are fantastic for sledding, so that's that should definitely stay in the winter. We, we, we make use of them. In this, they used to be mowed in the summer, but they no, haven't done that for a couple of years. So the, the growth of the grass is so high, so wild. That's a little bit of sad because I think if it's mowed properly, it would look way better and more accessible to climb up and down and just get your hiking in. Um, so yeah, those are a few things that I could think of right now. As for trees, there were a few trees right outside the Jackson Man School, like in the little bit of community garden that they have. And the, one of them, I think, um, snapped during the storm and consequently the next one was taken down as well so it's really like an open space right at the entrance where you come in from Webley um, it's a bit um, like you're missing something it would like it's uh, at least if you come there every day you're like wait I miss these trees right here um, I think those are a few yeah we definitely need new benches everywhere because they're they're falling apart um, we love the park, we love the activity in the summer, it's always so active, and yet you can find quiet spaces to sit, so that balance is definitely preferable, um, and I, yeah, that, I think that's the part I wanted to share. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to touch on a couple of issues that you raised, the playground, we try to get to renovating playgrounds about every uh, 15 years or so, so this is definitely in that in that zone and something that we would uh, be looking to improve probably in one of the earlier phases because of that age. Um, and it, it makes a huge difference in how the park is used um, and just kind of the general appearance of the park. Um, I think one of the things that the master plan, doing a master plan affords us is to consider whether that's the best spot for the, for the playground, whether it has issues uh, that we can address like accessibility, um, which is a, which is a concern um, or if there's other problems with it by looking at the park as a whole we can try to identify what the scope of that playground project could be so that it can properly address those issues um, and the other issue i just wanted to touch on is um, maintenance if there are um, if there's things like trash and glass and and other maintenance issues um, 
calling 311 from your phone if you happen to be in the park is a great way to, to let us know that there's some issues to be addressed uh, immediately. Um, I, we did talk to the, to the maintenance foreman, um, the superintendent, uh, walk through the park with him, which was great. Um, and I think we have changed how we're mowing that slope um, because it, it is difficult to maintain regularly. Um, and I, I think it does give a different character of that, but that's something, some of the maintenance uh, considerations of that we'll be looking at as well. Um, I'm gonna kill two birds with one stone by, uh, by allowing Nancy to talk and uh, Nancy, you can unmute when you're ready. And just to put on your radar, Nancy, there's some questions about lighting that uh, I know we've been working together on. Um, so if we can get to that uh, at some point when you. Uh, okay. uh -huh. Hi, it's Nancy, um, but actually it's Bob who, um, who had um, put his hand up. Oh. Um, but but if I could just say about the lighting, yes, there, okay. there is sort of accent lighting um, that will be installed along the pathways in a project that is pretty close to being ready to to be installed, I believe, and it will be in a, um, it will eliminate just eliminate the pathways uh, coming from Emory, Webley, Alston, Gordon, and along the main pathway. So and it will be low light. I see someone asked about that and. I, couldn't, I, I agree. Yeah, we want some uh, low, uh, low light that's more um, just to show the active spaces, uh, not to, not real high, <laughs> high intensity light. So. Right. There's so solar powered uh, light pylon. So it's a, it's a illuminated tube um, that is solar powered uh, to kind of fill in some of those gaps uh, in the short term. And I think when we consider any renovations, we want to reuse those since there was such an effort to uh to procure and uh, and fund that project yes. so yeah. and yeah. The, the and similarly with the other part of that project which is the entry pylons yeah. um that are going to be put in at the same time that mark each of those entrances at alston street emory webley and gordon and the um and the urban wilds area. entrance so those will be incorporating those. They may be cited differently at some point, but um, but they will. I think the intention, my intention, is to keep those on site. And, but, so can Bob ask his question? Since absolutely. Okay. Hi, okay. Uh, Bob Peshek, the Alston resident. Uh, first, I'm looking at the uh, photograph of the park, and just a general reminder: it's surrounded heavily by uh, residential areas completely. Uh, so anything that goes in there, we should think about the neighbors. That includes myself, of course. Uh, we've had six hour, very loud concerts without consultation. It makes for a rather long day when you live around there for uh, when there's a loud volume of music playing all day. Or things like a dog park bring noise and many at many hours of the day. Also, I'm wondering if you're talking to the school department because the last I went to a meeting a year ago and that may have changed the Jackson man was scheduled to run this school year and then be torn down to be what we don't know. So that's something to, to take into consideration. Uh, maybe you'll get a few extra acres, I don't know. But uh, back to the original uh, presentation about Stanley Ringer. Um, I've done some research on this on my own uh, and also when I was at the Parks Department and I'm looking at newspaper articles. He was killed in 1918 uh, as a U.S. Marine in World War I. Uh, I don't believe his family ever owned the land. It was a golf course shortly before Kenilworth Golf Course, not for not very long before it became a park and it was dedicated and 1925, I believe it was. Uh, his parents in Stanley lived on Nixon Place, which still exists right, right off the park, but it's not part of the park. Uh, and I will answer, uh, bring up another master plan that I have here, uh, done by another firm, I won't mention it, a few years ago. And they say Stanley Ringer was a real estate tycoon <laughs> that gave the land, the parkland to the city. Stanley was a poor young man that got killed in a war. 
Uh, and so I don't know where this history comes from. Whoever did the research, I would just suggest check out the Brighton Alston Historical Society. Go to their website. You might find some information there. But uh, this is twice now. It's been pointing out that the Ringer family, nothing against them, but they didn't own the land, I don't believe. So historical facts do matter. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Would you, I can't remember if you've shared that with me before. Um, would you mind sending me copies of that so I can share it with the design team and we can make sure it gets incorporated Absolutely. Uh, in our in our documents? Sure. It's also included in the pylon for the entryway from... Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Board um, at Alston Street. Yeah. Thank, yes, thank at Alston Street. Thanks. Sure, I will. Sorry. Um, I'm going to answer this question since Bob mentioned it. It's also in our Q&A. Um, we are coordinating with the with Jackson Matt to get a sense of how they use the site, but um, but I do understand that um, there's a separate process for the improvements of that building, not just improvements, I think is the current thinking. But um, so I will be coordinating with BPS and with the Jackson Man uh, staff, specifically the principal, to try to get a sense of how they do use the site. So that can be incorporated because I think the future of that site will likely remain um, community center and school, but the, you know, the shape may change. Um, and the, it's possible that the grade configuration, maybe they're thinking I thought that would change as well. Um, so I don't know what they're thinking is, but, um, but that's something that we will be coordinating on with our process as well, as much as we can, we can while there's, I think their process is gonna be longer and more specific, but uh, we'll coordinate with them. Um, I'm going to let Rosie Hanlon pop in because I think she may have some comments on that. So Rosie, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yep. I think I did. Did I? Yep. Oh, great. Hello, and thank you for hosting this. Um, so the, the community center um, thrives and really depends upon this park uh, every day, winter, spring, summer, fall. So when the planning is, is coming to fruition, and I'm not sure, has, has the planning actually started? I, I jumped in late on this, so did the planning for the park start already? This is the first meeting. Okay, great. Um, so, so I, I would really like to uh, help and assist. Um, I, I love this and um, would, would really like to um, our input into it. The dog park is a big issue for our kids. Um, we had baseball clinics there from, um, the spring all the way to the late fall, and it's it's almost unusual, uh, unusable since the 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 dog. It's it's pretty much become a dog park, and um, we held the permit this summer. And uh, folks that were out there with their dogs got pretty upset whenever we'd say anything to them about you know please either pick up or you know please don't come here when the kids are here. But it's it's an issue, and um, I'm a big fan of dog parks, but not in a baseball field. Um, I, I, those two uses are pretty incompatible with each other. Yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that this process is beginning. This is an amazing treasure in our community, and it's also uh, a, a big component of the community center. So thank you. Thanks. Um, there's been a couple of comments. I'm just going to read them so that everybody knows, and I can dismiss them. Um, with a young kid living on the edge of Imry Street next to Ringer. I'm extremely excited for more activities such as concerts, dog park, and maybe even fairs. That's a great, um, a great comment that um, I will, I think I've done that correctly. Um, the concrete sidewalk, especially in front of the slope heading towards Alston Street gets very icy in the winter because the sidewalks seem to be lower than the surrounding uh, ground. So water accumulates there. We can definitely address the drainage issues, um, but I'm just going to add that we don't routinely plow that uh, pathway. We do with the, the perimeter sidewalks, but don't are not able to, uh, we don't have the staff to plow all of the uh, interior pathways in every park that we own throughout the city. So uh, the, the sidewalks get prioritized uh, over interior pathways. Um, I'm going to allow Jill and C's Vanderpool to, to unmute themselves. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. And, and this is Jill speaking. Just thank you for taking the time to talk to the community. I wanted to, I think, echo 
a lot of folks sentiment around a dog park. We have lived around the park for the last five years and have really fallen in love with the relationships we've built with other neighbors through having a dog. And I think, you know, we use the field because that's what the most safe area is provided to us. But I think all of the dog, you know, well, I can't speak for everybody, but for us as dog owners, having a safe space that's dedicated and separate from the field so that everybody has a space where they're morning, night, sometimes at lunchtime, and it feels like a huge need. And I think it would just be very helpful to maybe consider space near the entrance to Gordon Street, which is empty and fairly unused. You know, I, I think there could be some creative planning to allow everyone to have a safe space to use the park. Great, thank you. Um, there was one comment I wanted to, uh, to read, um, the urban wealth has great potential, but needs a lot of work. Could this area be livened up with new paths and interactive, interactive natural play areas or nature interpretation areas? Is there a way to make people feel safe using this area? I think that's definitely one of the goals that, um, that we have for that area is making it feel safe and perhaps, uh, you know, thinking about how that area can really be tied into the rest of the park and, uh, and feel, feel welcoming and, and safe. Um, Amy, I'm gonna allow you to talk and unmute yourself. Amy Parzic. Yep, yep, now, how, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, again, I do appreciate, um, you know, this, uh, you know, initiative taking place. Um, as a you know resident of Alston for oh gosh going on 20 years now and having lived um, right next to Ringer, um, you know for a number of years this is a you know it's a wonderful uh, resource um, and because it's in such a highly dense population you know the challenge of balancing you know all of these factors um, you know all of the uses of it um, I'm a dog owner so I will absolutely you know second the you know, request for, you know, a, a dog park fenced area. Um, yes, I recognize that there's a small dog park in Lower Alston and one on Western Avenue. But again, this is such a highly dense area um, with a significant number of owners. It makes sense to have a resource here. And as a owner, an owner, <laughs> um, as a parent. <laughs> owner um, of children, that's fine. <laughs> um, you know, I do think, um, you know, having, you know, some of the concerns with regards to, um, you know, broken glass, um, you know, the trash, um, I would like to request in part of the plan that, you know, there be perhaps sharps containers at the, you know, playground and other locations, because, you know, while it's not a regular occurrence, you know, they are found in the park and having a safe place to dispose of them, I think would certainly be, um, an asset. Um, and as I abut the park, I recognize, you know, that I, you know, you want to have visibility, because um, obviously, you know, in the darkness, you don't want, you know, there to be, you know, difficulties in, you know, traveling, but you have to balance that with, you know, both light pollution, you know, as a, someone who enjoys stargazing, you know, the light that's constantly around can really be a tremendous challenge. Um, and as I live right next to the park, the illumination just, I mean, it, it glares into the, you know, even with light blocking shades, you know, it we, works its way around the corners. Um, and so balancing that um, is certainly a request uh, there. I'm actually um, having just hearing about these light pylons, um, you know, that uh, at the end of Emory Road, I'm actually kind of concerned about that as my house is right there in the windows. I just don't want ambient light all night long in the um, you know, coming, you know, right there. So they, the light pylons are going to be along the pathway between Alston and Gordon Street. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what the designed lumens would be, but it's intended to be a diffuse glow. Um, and they're, they are solar powered. So I imagine that once the, once they've been charged and the battery runs down for the night, um, that it would be off. Okay. Right, yeah, um, I mean, but it, we'll see how they go. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I, I recognize the, you know, the need for lights, but like some of the lights coming out from underneath the Jackson man, I mean, they're just blinding yeah. um, in the, at nighttime. Yeah, there are definitely improvements that could be made to some of the lighting. Um, 
is it the lights on the playground that um, are glaring? The, I mean, those are certainly a piece of it. No, um, the ones I'm thinking of are, um, you know, the there's a, you know, the um, actually, like, I think they're literally underneath the Jackson Man uh, okay. school. Yeah. Um, and as a dog owner, you take your dog out for a, a late night walk. Those light, they really do. They're just kind of angled because the way they're positioned underneath the school, how it overhangs that uh, playground area. Um, you know, they really do kind of just like blind people in the, um, as they're passing through that park. Yeah. yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think that's unfortunately something that would probably best be addressed by the, the building renovation. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we'll, you know, I'll do my best to track that and share those comments with the school department. Um, but I, and I imagine that there will be a public process around that building as well, but um, mm -hmm. I'm not in charge of that process. Um, <laughs> so um, I think there was another comment that you had, um, letting the plants grow on the hillside as a butterfly habitat and also to oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. reduce erosion. That's a great point. Um, and I think that can definitely enhance the park. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I mean, as you address the issue of um, drainage, I mean, so much of that park, if you just look around, um, the whenever there's a heavy rainfall, um, you can literally see the channels that are being dug yeah. by water overflow. And, and afterwards, you can see those channels creating ruts. Yeah, we noticed that. Yeah. And so I think, you know, having, you know, plants that have deeper root systems by being allowed to grow will you know, reduce some of that erosion as well as putting in better uh, drainage points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the, if you do see uh, needles out there before we're able to implement a full uh, or you know, any renovation projects, please call 311. We do have a dedicated SHARPS team in the city that uh, can be deployed to, to come and remove those safely. Mm -hmm. Oh, I also have a question. I haven't checked. Oh, I, I'm not sure if I'm still. No, you're still unmuted. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but um, there was, um, and I put in a 311 request on this um, a couple of times over the summer. There was a wasp's nest um, in the top lot. Hmm. Uh, those trees okay. that are in there um, have really been dying slowly um, over yeah. the course of years. And there's a wasp nest in one of those trees. And um, the last time I looked, it had not been removed despite um, requests into 311 to have that addressed, which is, you know, with children there, I mean, that's just a bad yeah. combination. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll mention that to the, the superintendent. Okay. Um, Lee, if you'd like to unmute yourself whenever you're ready. Hi, uh, my name's Lee. Uh, my wife and I, we recently moved to right, right around the corner from uh, Ringer Park. Uh, we're just really looking forward to this park being a place where we can send our kid to and everything. Uh, we're really hoping that in this new development for the park, there's more activity such as just more, more of a, uh, a neighborhood atmosphere there, such as uh, Someone had mentioned earlier the idea of concerts and other things being hosted in the park. We're excited about that idea and potentially- I think that was your comment, Lee. No, 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 I think it was like Christine. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> uh, no, I was just agreeing with that. Um, okay. But yeah, uh, I'm hoping we, there's more of that, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping also, could we look at a way to really, um, hone in on if there could be a dog park in this park because like every like for years we just see people use the baseball field as that so actually having a dog park would be great to to i guess uh decrease that particular issue in the park um and we need more of those in austin brighton anyway so i'm hoping those two areas like more activity through like concerts as well as actually having a dog park within the park are something that's, that are really invested in in the plan yeah, so um, let me read some of the comments that have come in around the dog park. Um, I'm trying to scan quickly, so forgive me if I skip any. Um, Andrea Howard from the Western House uh, said, please don't discount the role that dog owners have played to increase the safety in the park. 
as mentioned earlier, it's a train that's hard to have consistent surveillance. So this activity of dog owners provides invaluable eyes on the park. Smith has a much better sight line making it safer to begin with. If Austin can only have one, consider the greater benefit of safety that's have by is found by having it at Ringer. Um, I think uh, Bob's point about um, some of the um, the noise and the the odor that maybe um, maybe as a result of the dog park are good points. Um, if you make here uh, EM more, he, I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing it. It's hard to tell what's the name. Um, hi, if you make an actual dog park and ringer, please consider it making it large enough for dogs to fully run and don't use gravel like Smith as it makes it hard for dogs to run. A dog park would be, get a lot of daily use. Tudor Street Dog Park in Cambridge would be a great uh, model design. And that's a great note. And I will definitely um, take note of it. Always looking for great examples that people find. Um, I think that may be all of the comments about dogs. Dogs dominate in the, the park in part because people are not playing baseball, softball like they used to, which is definitely a good point, um, especially these days uh, in the past six to nine months. Um, but the, as we noted in the presentation, the, the ball field is permitted, I think nearly daily. Is that right, Kyle? I, I'm not even remembering my own yes. notes. Um, no unleashed dogs, please. Um, so I'm going to move on to Rowan. Rowan, if you you're ready, you're clear to unmute yourself. Hi. Thanks. Yeah. Um, it was less of a question and more uh, of an observation that um, I, as I walk through. I'm, I'm a neighbor here, live at the top of Glenville, so I can see Ringer right now out of my window, um, especially the wooded area. There is a, a lot of trash build up there, um, but it seems that it's largely due to a lack of receptacles for, for people to um, put their trash. So if there was a place to put those and for that to be managed regularly, then I think there's less um, cans and bottles on the ground and less cans and bottles or glass for people to smash as they please. Um, so I, I've noticed that and I do uh, I love and appreciate the wooded area, the privacy, the um, shade and um, elevation kind of um, varied uh, terrain that's there for hiking, sitting, picnicking, uh, hammocking, enjoying that kind of uh, secluded area within Halston and the city. So um, I love the area and I think that um, those kind of concerns that people have can be mitigated with uh, just simple receptacles for, uh, for that um, material. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to answer one quick question. Are you considering limiting the fence around the baseball field to create an open field and moving the dogs to a dog run more benches for older people? Um, I think any everything's on the table at this point. So I'm also going to make a uh, read one more comment that was, are we considering field options that are not ballparks? To me, these are connected in some way. Uh, the community center may indeed do clinics there, but in the six years I've lived it adjacent to Ringer, I've seen fewer than five organized ball games there. Um, and I think I think everything is on the table. I think it's a matter of getting the, you know, making sure that it would fit size-wise and making sure that it would be appropriately used um, and permitted. Um, and Rosie, I think, is is agreeing with me. Perhaps we can have the ballpark that can accommodate soccer activities as well. Prior to the Jackson Man, prior to the pandemic, Jackson Man Community Center served a minimum of 200 families each week with soccer. Also, drainage in the ballpark is not great. So both of those points are um, are ones that we'll be looking at. What other uses might uh, might fit in that space, um, or perhaps beyond, and what the impact to the park would be. What and what. Um, we think would be um, appropriately permitted. Um, Janine, I'm gonna allow you to talk um, and you can unmute yourself. And then just to 
we only have about 15 minutes left. So I'm going to prioritize people who are on the phone or sorry, not on the phone, there's nobody on the phone, are who want to speak. Um, and if there are open questions at the end, I will follow up. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity. I think this is great. Um, I'm, I, my, I guess listening to the architect talking about the spaces, things of that nature, um, my first thought is about the performance space, or that's what I termed the performance space, which is the circular area uh, that was once grassed and now used as a space for activities. Uh, if they're going to make it a, an official performance space, they need to gravel that area because it has been overrun and um, very unsightly and uh, does present an issue. Uh, so we need to get a handle on whether that's really going to be a performance space or is that going to be an entrance space that needs to be upgraded and maintained as you enter off of Emory Road. Um, some of the other things, because I am a mother, my child is not a child anymore, she's older, and I had the opportunity to appreciate the uh, young child area, which was new at the time. I know as much as things, uh, as years pass, things dilapidate and go bad. Um, it was once a beautiful space. I know now that it's overrun by teenagers or young adults hanging out in the middle of the night. Maintenance is an issue with the city. Uh, no matter what you put there, there's gotta be a better job of maintaining that property on the playground so that it can be useful for bringing in young families and them using that space. Uh, the other thing I want to note is that I, over the years, because I have lived here in excess of 25 years, um, the fences, I noticed when Menino was leaving, uh, for some reason they changed the fences from a company up in New Hampshire to redo all the fences and they didn't hold up very well. I want to make sure that you have a good company that uses products that seem to withstand some kind of abuse from animals, things of that nature, and wear and tear. Because the fences are basically falling apart in, in certain areas at the bottom, especially where dogs can get to them or kids can kick them in. Um, another thing is, um, of course, the, the area by the Jackson Man School that abuts the park or that you, know, you walk from the park, there needs to be some type of fence leading to the homes that are in the back or something that cuts off private area when you actually have homeowners back there because it has been and still remains a liability. And the city doesn't take responsibility and neither does the Jackson man. So it's just like a, a mixed bag of a little bit of a mess. But uh, the last two things I want to say is that, um, is that, of course, as a dog owner, I mean, this dog park issue has always been an issue. Uh, I would say the first 10 years that I have been a was a dog owner, I still am now, um, we, we uh, discussed this issue with the city as well and decided that the softball field would not be a dog area, that we would take our dogs up on the hill and also secondly, take our dogs over by the tennis court, courts and the gravel area. Those were the two designated spots that the police as well as the city had agreed that we could use and not the baseball field. And the baseball field used for baseball or because it was a permanent area. But for some reason over the, over the last five years, there's so many new dog owners that you know, may not know that it, it is something that's not supposed to be used by the dog owners, even though we enjoy it. It really is something that has already been hashed out and agreed to that we would take our dogs to another location. Because how can the individuals who want to use the softball field for softball actually use the space of appropriately. So I think that needs to be communicated by the Boston police who, who uh, enforce that. And uh, I know we have different police officers in charge, things of that nature, changing of the guards, but this issue is not new. It's been hashed out 
and we just need to stop moving in that direction eventually until we get a dog park. Um, Great. And Thank then you. Guess the very last thing is the tennis courts and the basketball area. Even though it seems like it was originally two tennis courts areas and then you made it into a basketball, I think the architect said. But I think that um, there's so much need nowadays that maybe additional tennis courts and as well as basketball courts should be considered. And that's my last thought. Yeah, we can, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, we'll take a look at the fit Thank of you. those. Um, I'm gonna allow, I'm gonna skip over a couple of people who've already spoken and try to hear from, uh, from some who we haven't heard from yet. Huckleberry, I've, uh, you can unmute yourself. Hi, how's it going? Um, thank you for having this meeting. And I just wanted to uh, talk about the uh, having lights on at the basketball court. So uh, I think the community would really benefit from having lights on at the basketball and tennis courts uh, as it gets darker into the evening, especially during the fall and spring. Uh, but the weather is still good. A lot of people uh, really want to stay out and keep on playing exercising, uh, but they're unable to. So. I was hoping that uh, we could see what could be done to get the lights back on. They used to be on about a year or two ago, and it was great. Community was starting to build, then they turned off, and no one really knew what was going to why that happened. And that's all. Thank you. Um, I um, uh, they were they were turned off um, at the request of some of the immediate abutters that um, that do have a lot of those glare issues. Um, so that has been a concern, an ongoing concern of theirs and some of the activity I think that was happening later at night. Um, just a little bit of background um, and uh, Nancy and Bob, if that's something you wanna address um, yeah. directly, but I think, you know, there is some new technology these days that has better cutoffs. Um, can I, uh, are we on? Yep. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, as for the lights, uh, in the summertime, there's about 14 hours of daylight, well past the official closing time of the park. The basketball court, uh, they can come to my home and witness this. Even in the winter, if the, if the courts are dry, there will be 24 hour activity. Not always, but someone playing basketball. And by the way, that's not a complaint for me. That's just a statement of fact. It's used tennis, not so much when it's dark, 14 hours in the summertime, which is the, in the summer is getting longer. That is the normal recreation time. Winter in New England isn't so much of a tennis place. Uh, the lights should be removed. That's my humble personal opinion and give us some more sky back and not waste money. But Kathy, that's, uh, and we also, I have a petition that a bunch of people around the park that live here 20 years ago, and many of them are still there, late city councilor Brian Honan sent it to the late park commissioner, Justine Liff, asking that the lights be turned off. A lot of good reasons, hasn't really changed. But Kathy, I have a question about dog parks. Sure. Is there minimum square footage requirements, large dogs, small dogs? In other words, if we're gonna look at Ringer Park, how realistic what kind of space do we need? And then where do you find the space in the park? Those are great questions, Bob. And- um, And a water source, I believe also, right? Yeah, we do have water here. So that's definitely um, a plus. Um, I don't know the square footage requirements and I don't know that there are official requirements or guidelines for a dog park. Um, but I think as part of the next meeting, we could show some examples and show the size and what that size would mean on this property. Thank you. Um, so I think that's something that we can, we can, we can take a look at and study and, uh, and bring some information to the conversation. We need that. Thank you. I look yeah. forward to that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we have a couple more comments um, and then we'll, we can wrap up. So Jill and C's, I think it was Jill. Oh, no, okay. Janine, do you have one more comment? Oh, sorry. 
Sorry. Um, I, I'm sorry. I guess I was so long winded. You didn't hear me before. There, there is areas for the dogs that were established by the police as well as the community uh, policing community and in Ring of Park before. The dog areas are on top of the hill as well as in the gravel area. So people need to start moving their dogs to that direction. Right, so th those aren't, they're not signed that way. That's not um, an official designation. That may have been a, a fine okay. agreement okay. Um, 20 years ago. These days, um, the city has been installing um, dog parks in, in parks throughout the, throughout the city. Um, they usually are best when there's a friends group and an organized dog group associated with them. Um, so that, but the unofficial designations are are hard to communicate to everybody. Um, so something that is a clearly defined space um, gives everyone a lot more certainty about what to expect and um, where to do that. Um, Whitney, I can't remember if I um, if uh, you had spoken before. Yeah. Hi, I just wanted to thank Bob for the history, and and uh, and Jan Janine. For, for her current uh, information, um, I'm a seventh generation uh, resident um, and uh, have recently uh, moved just down the road. And I really would like to start educational programs working with the school, with the town, um, uh, the mayor's art, I don't know if it was in the arts council, but, um, he was putting in gardens, the new mayor, Mahdi, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the gardening. And I want to um, work with um, trying to get that glass cleaned up and, and making those areas interactive. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do just putting up little um, signs to identify plants, starting educational programs with there's so many uh, parents with children um, and now with the school not there opportunity i see opportunities here to 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 get everybody involved and to work with a lot of programs that are out here already um you have so many universities around here and uh, students who need things to do uh, so um I, there i have a lot of ideas i'm here now um i have the time i'm more than willing to commit um on a regular basis so uh, thank you, everybody. I can't wait to see what happens next. That's Great. it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to allow Jill to speak, and then we're, I think we are going to wrap up. So you should be able to unmute yourself. Hello, this is Case. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Hi. Um, yeah, we, uh, uh, we live uh, right on, em on Emory Road. Um, uh, so I think uh, and this is sort of, you know, I guess uh, the the dog discussion is is a, is a is a is a point of debate, uh, which is great, uh, and I, uh, we'd love to see it on the on the agenda uh, for next time. Um, but it might be a suggestion uh, for the architect to have a look at that area um, between Gordon and the um, tennis courts, uh, because right now I think that's sort of designated as a you know a, a spontaneously a ripped up path, but there's, there's actually a fair amount of space there uh, that could be uh, potentially a dog park. Uh, but it might be good to put that in the plan as you know something that, that could maybe be developed. Um, and then just a small comment. Um, there's um, the urban wild area, which is uh, also something, a place that I really love. Um, there's a, a large concrete block buried uh, right in the middle of that path, uh, if you come from Gordon uh, and make a right there, um, where there are um, bolts sticking out. Um, and I think sometimes people put like a little orange flag on it or something. Uh, but it, if there's going to be any development, it might be good to get that removed because uh, it's a it's a tripping hazard. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I think... Um... If there are additional questions, um, please please continue to put them in the 
in the Q&A and I will follow up with you uh, individually. Uh, but I do wanna to start wrapping up because we're just about 7.30. Um, so the next steps uh, in our process, um, we've developed a, an online survey. The link is there. Um, you can also use that QR code or you can go to our project website down at the bottom, uh, which you can also use that QR code or uh, boston.gov slash ringer dash park uh, is the short URL that we have for this, for this site. Um, that will take you to the project website and there's a link to that survey on the website. Uh, you may see us in the park in the coming days uh, when we pop up in the park. We'll be asking park users who may not have known about this meeting uh, or weren't able to join us for their thoughts about the park and sharing the survey link. We'll also have hard copies of the survey available and uh, we will of course be following social distancing guidelines. We'll be placing yard signs, uh, those kind of political sized uh, signs in the park shortly, uh, probably next this uh, weekend when we pop up in the park um, with the link for the survey and the, the link for the project website and to just let people, more people know that what we're doing in the park. Um, you can go to the website and find out some more information. This presentation, uh, the slides are already posted there. As soon as this renders, I will be posting the video online as well so that you can uh, share the video link with your neighbors. Um, and uh, you and your neighbors can also contact me at kathy.baker-eclipse at boston.gov or uh, by phone at 617-961-3058 um, or you can just call the uh, 311 and it'll eventually get to me. Um, so I wanna thank you all for joining this meeting. I hope it was helpful for you. Um, we're gonna be returning um, late fall, early winter to, to bring you some design alternatives. Um, some more information about what we discussed today. We'll be uh, developing some, some design alternatives and seeing how things fit. Um, so that's part of our process. If I didn't get to your question tonight, I'll follow up with you directly in the next few days. Um, so I wanna thank you all for your time, your really thoughtful questions and, uh, and comments, and uh, hope to see you when we reconvene later on in a few weeks. Thank you. <laughs>